Um, hi. So, um, hello from Poland, first of all. Um, I'm real happy to be the finale of this year's Predicar event. Um, today, I will be talking about what I believe to be some factors responsible for linguistic variation. Um, I guess I'll switch to my screen now. Okay, so my focus today will be on, well, constraints and variation in formulate language, right? And I want to start by asking one big fundamental question, and that's specifically what exactly is linguistic variation, right? It's a deep philosophical question, and I don't have a fully uh, satisfactory answer to it and that's probably because there are more than one answer and there are more than one factors um, uh, than that the, the responsible for um, linguistic variation but i hope to show what the answer might be or at least part of the answer right to this question now we we may break this question down into smaller or maybe paraphrase this question in, in the following ways we can ask how should variation be characterized? Okay, uh, how should it be described? What exactly is its nature? Or what factors are behind linguistic variation? Now, um, right off the bat, there is one thing we can say, uh, and it's it's more of an assumption that we're making, that I'll be making here, and, and, and it's that, you know, when it comes to linguistic variation, there is no such thing as free variation. Right? Factors that are responsible for uh, variation in, in language, mm, or factors that drive variation, basically rule out what we think of, of as free variation. And by free variation, what I mean by free variation here is something in the sense of, you know, rolling a die where, you know, you can think of a perfect die where each side has a roughly equal probability of being rolled and you know there is no way you can predict which side will be rolled now i'm idealizing away you know the fact that this true randomness does not even exist okay uh, because there is no such thing as a perfect die and there you know each die has tiny imperfections that basically skew the probabilities of one side being rolled more often than the others okay these these imperfections are really really tiny OK, but they are enough to make perfectly free or perfectly random variation impossible. Right. But, you know, I'm not going to worry about such um, details here. OK, I'm not going to worry about the fact that all dice are at least slightly rigged. You know, we're, we're going to agree that this is as close as we can get to real. Perfect random free variation. OK. But the point that I want to make is that in language, this free variation does not exist. OK. Um, this rolling die style variation is not found in language for a reason that we'll see in a moment. You know, but this this point has been made by a number of authors. Um, so I'm not really breaking any new ground. You know, one, one example, one author, Hernandez Campoy said, uh, that linguistic variation is not free at all, but rather constrained by social and or situational factors. A little more specific is this quote uh, from Koenig 2010, uh, who says it's probably better to assume that there is no such thing as free variation. Free variants would then be those whose determining factors are still unknown. So what Koenig is saying is that there are factors, you know, there are um, forces, real um, mechanisms that make variation not so free, where basically the, 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 the me uh, mechanisms that make um, the frequency of one variant different than the frequency of another, uh, of, of another variant, but we simply don't know what those mechanics are. But there is basically the possibility that at some point in the future we'll know 
what those factors are, and then you know what what appears to be free variation will not be so free after all. All right. So essentially, what these two authors are saying is that this free variation is basically only an illusion. All right, and it results from our ignorance of what the determining factors are. And and this is um, a um, it's it's consistent with a with a more general idea that that comes from the world of uh, physics and philosophy and mathematics, where where um, the consensus is almost um, you know identical here. Here's um, Motzkin from. 1967, he, he, he's a mathematician, and he said something like, you know, in a large universe, disorder is probable, but complete disorder is impossible. Okay, so just, just to sum up uh, what we've seen so far, you know, we can, we can uh, remember that language, of course, can be free from variation. There is always variation, you know, but the variation we see in language can't be entirely free. OK. Why not? What are the determining factors behind variation? They, these factors come in two flavors, all right, two kinds. And then kind number one has to do with the fact that variants can be inherently rigged. So if you take two, if you take an expression or or a grammatical construction or a word that comes in two variants, all right, one variant will be more frequent than the other because there is something about it that makes it more tempting or you know more attractive to, you know in usage and then it becomes more frequent and the other um, factor um, is at work when you start out with um, two variants that are not inherently rigged they could each have you know, equal um, chances of, of becoming more frequent, but one of them becomes more frequent through what is known as the Matthew effect. Now, I'm guessing many of you, most of you will know what the Matthew effect is, but um, here's just a quick primer. The Matthew effect of accumulated advantage, okay? Um, the name comes from the Bible, of all places, uh, from Matthew's Gospel, the line specifically, "He ha he who has much will get more, and he who has nothing will lose even that little that he has." All right. So the the idea is basically that once one variant becomes slightly more frequent than the other, this um, asymmetry will only become more um, severe, okay, or stronger. And that's because once one variant becomes more frequent, it then becomes um, it's it's then heard more often by more people. And then, you know, in the in the minds of those people, this variant will become more psychologically entrenched and this will um, then further increase the frequency and so on. So we're dealing here with a kind of self feeding loop, right, where the accruing frequency of one form or one variant increases the chances of that frequency growing further still okay now here's one specific example of how the matthew effect is probably responsible for these um strong symmetries in frequencies of of, of variants so we're looking here at um the life of two variants of the expression double-edged sword and its variant double-edged weapon. So as you can see, um, this chart comes from Google Trends, which uh, allows you to trace, you know, the frequencies of usage of, of two things or two expressions. Um, and the data come, the, 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 the data start, um, in the year 2004, so mm, um, 18 years worth of, of data, January 1st, 2004, all the way up to now. And you can you can trace, you know, the frequencies of, of the two expressions. You can see double-edged sword starts out being the, the dominant ones, and it 
never really, uh, except for this moment here, uh, this looks like year 2005, maybe 2006, where the frequencies become almost equal, but then, you know, uh, double-edged sword again takes center stage and it drives double-edged weapon to the back um, and and it, the situation ba basically remains the same all the way up up till now. Now, although this the the timeline starts in 2004, uh, we can guess that the situation um, looked more or less the same, you know, in the years prior to that. But what we can, um, if it, if I think it's safe to speculate that there was a point in the past, you know where the two started out as potential equals, okay? So they started out being um, equally frequent, okay? There was a point of equilibrium in the past. And then through some accident of history, the frequencies of one of the, of the two forms uh, skyrocketed, okay? And they tipped the that there was a tipping point. They tipped in the direction of double-edged sword, okay, and this resulted in in the double-edged sword almost ousting the the variant uh, double-edged weapon. Okay. Now there is nothing about double-edged sword that makes it better than double-edged weapon. Where the, 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 the nothing that makes it more likely to become the more frequent um, variant. It was, like I said, probably just an accident of history that drove the frequencies of sword high enough to make it the dominant variant and leaving, you know, double edged weapon, you know, <clears throat> lagging behind. Here's the situation of these two variants in um, five languages. So apart from English, we have data from the um, uh, Corpus de Español, okay, from Spanish. This is Portuguese, Corpus de Portugues, um, and um, the last two languages, Polish and Czech, come the, the data come from Google. But what the numbers show you is that the um, orientations here are rather unpredictable. So, you know, it's not free variation in the sense that, you know, each uh, option has equal chances or equal probabilities of being used, okay? there In each case, there is a very strong asymmetry where one variant is the dominant one and, you know, it kind of cannibalizes the other one, all right? But it's not random in the sense that, you know, clearly there is, the, um, um, so, so um, what's um, um, what's not free about this variation is that there is this asymmetry. But what's random is that you can't predict for each language, you know, how the asymmetries will be skewed. So for English, the sword option is more frequent, but in Spanish, it's the weapon that is more frequent. Arma de doble filo, filo is more frequent than spada de doble filo, filo, right? In Portuguese. The situation is even more complicated because although we have both variants, both equivalents are present in Portuguese, arma de dois gumes versus espada de dois gumes, both are um, attested, but arma is the the less frequent one. And it's almost un, it's almost inexistent. Only 18 um, occurrences versus 363. But what's interesting is that in Portuguese, it's not the sword that is the dominant um, option, but faca de dois gumes, which is like the knife, the double-edged knife. Okay. Then in Polish, Polish for Polish, the, it's the sword that is more frequent. But on the other hand, in Czech, as you can see, it's the weapon. Dvosečna zbraň is, 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 zbraň is weapon and mech is the, the sword. Again, both are found, both are attested, but it's the weapon that is um, the, the dominant choice in, in Czech. Now, what can we say about the possible factors behind 
this variation. I mean, you know, the best we can say at this point is probably that these factors are beyond the bounds of language. They have nothing to do with the expressions themselves. There is nothing inherently interesting about, you know, sword that makes it more common or more frequent than than weapon. Whatever the what, whatever the frequency, uh, whatever the factors were in for each language, they were most likely extra linguistic. They had little to do with the expressions themselves. Right? You know, one way to think about it is um, to apply the metaphor of the drunkard's walk. Okay, the metaphor that we have in the title of this great book by Leonard Mladino, The Drunkard's Walk, How Randomness Rules Our Lives. Here's a um, Brazilian uh, translation of the book. But the idea is basically this, you know, how, how a random process will proceed is not predictable any more than a drunkard's next step is predictable. Okay, so if you imagine a drunkard walking, if you, if you made a video of um, a drunk person's walking, OK, now, if you freeze the video, if you pause the video and ask where, I mean, what the, the person's next step will be, it's anybody's guess. It's it's hard to predict, you know, will he reel to the left? Will he lurch to the right? You know, who knows? OK, there is no way to predict it. it, it this is the the randomness that we find, you know, especially in this. So, you know, you, you can think of these two um, um, of this expression, it's two variants is a case of the drunkard's walk. So in English, if you freeze the frame, you know, and then if you if you play the video, your drunkard will step to the right toward the sword um, variant. But in Spanish, he'll reel to the left in Portuguese. Again, it's to the right in Polish. It's to the toward the sword scenario but in check it's it's to the left uh, toward the um the the weapon scenario now like i said there is nothing consistent I and mean, nothing inherent about these expressions that makes you know the probability of one being more frequent than the other okay um the the um the choice is unpredictable it's run it's random it's just as random as this drunk uh, person's walking. Okay. The in interesting question is, does language have um, examples or scenarios of variants of expressions that are actually uh, not so random where, you know, you can um, imagine the drunkard being kind of weighted toward one side. So he will consistently um, step toward one in, in one direction more often than the other one. And the quick answer to this question is yes, this is, uh, this is possible. And we were, we're, we're going to look at some examples of this, um, in just a moment. But before we do, uh, two results of the Matthew effect in language. Um, one effect, um, has to do with the situation where one variant becomes so dominant that it basically kills the other um, variant and it drives it out of usage. This is what happened to um, the spider um, competition versus um, other cop. In Old English, the word for spider was at or cop. OK, now for whatever reason, um, speakers of Old English um, abandoned this word under the influence of spiders. So basically spider started being used and more and more often and it spider eventually ousted adder cop completely. So that, you know, the word adder cop is now only found, it only survives in the in the compound cobweb, all right? Originally it was cobweb like this. Um, and it also kind of survives in, in poetry and literature as in this example from The Hobbit by Tolkien, mm. but it's pretty safe to say that it, you know, for most native speakers of English, the word outer cop is, is pretty much dead. It's non-existent in most speakers of English mental lexicons, right? The other scenario is coexistence of two variants where one variant is the dominant variant and the other one is less frequent, 
but it still survives. OK, and this, you know, one case, um, one example of this uh, coexistence is, the, you know, the the two nouns fall versus its its um, synonym autumn. So fall is the American variant, and autumn is the British variant. Okay. Um, now, it's significant. Why is it significant? Well, because well, these two illustrate the situation where you can you you have coexistence of two variants where both of them survive and it's very unlikely for one of them to um, fall out of usage completely right and um, the and the the other reason is that um, they illustrate very nicely what happens to the less frequent variant okay the less frequent variant um, let's look at the situation, in, you know, from the British perspective, where autumn is the dominant variant and fall is um, um, something of a special purpose word. It's a word for special occasions. Look, this this comes uh, this description comes from comes from Fowler, 1965, and Fowler said that the noun fall as a synonym for the ordinary autumn is either an Americanism a provincialism or an archaism, right? So for British speakers, the word fall is a familiar noun, right? They know what fall means. They know that it's a synonym for, for autumn, but they don't use it, okay? Or when they do use it, that that's they, they have to have special reasons for using it. They want to sound archaic, they want to sound like Shakespeare, or they want to sound more American then they will use fall, but otherwise autumn is the unmarked default choice. Now for American English, it's the other way around. So, you know, uh, in American English speakers will use fall most of the time, 99% of the time they will use fall. And autumn is reserved for special occasions because it's either, you know, poetic. By the way, these are the reactions that I found that, that I got from native speakers of English that I've queried about their impressions of autumn. And they said that to them it sounds just poetic or it's used in songs, autumn leaves. Uh, it sounds fancy or it sounds dated. Um, so again, just like in the case of fall in British English, for Americans, autumn is a um, is the less frequent variant that they use only on special occasions, special occasions, right? Now, um, now this coexistence is significant because the main idea is that each variant has its place, right? Uh, one is the default choice. It's the ordinary, typical um, uh, word or expression, and the other is reserved for special occasions. So you have to have special reasons for using it. Its use must be justified, OK? So it's not a free choice kind of um, situation, right? Um, when when confronted between the, the, the two options, depending on whether you're a speaker of British English or American English, your choice will be automatically one. Um, it'll be more, it, it's more, one is always more likely to be um, chosen than the other one. The other one is, uh, for special occasions, all right? Now, we're going to look at a situation where um, the drunkard's walk is more predictable. Now, I want you to imagine this drunkard, uh, this person is still drunk, but, you know, he's um, walking and on his shoulder, uh, on, on, on one shoulder, he is uh, carrying a heavy bag or something. And uh, so as a result, he will always be tilted to one side and most of the steps he takes will be toward one direction, right? Now, um, this is what happens in the case of collocations with, uh, with the noun goal, okay? So um, we'll be talking about soccer or what is known in British English as, as football. Um, Goal is the is is the event when one team um, places the ball in the goal of the opponent, and you can look at this event from two different perspectives. You can you can uh, look at it from the perspective of the striker who scores a goal, all right, or you can look at it 
from the perspective of the goalkeeper who concedes a goal, right? Now, before anything else, I, I need to stress that these are not typical examples of synonyms or true synonyms, right? These are known, these are special cases of synonymy known as converses, okay? So they describe uh, the same situation, but from two different perspectives, all right? Um, now, what we find here is that there is a very strong symmetry toward score a goal, okay? So, um, first of all, there are more verbs that are used with the with the with the noun goal so you can score a goal but you can add or you can bag a goal you can claim a goal earn a goal gain a goal etc cetera, etc cetera, right whereas for concede the choice of of uh, synonyms is smaller so as you, as we can see the score a goal perspective is the dominant choice here over concede a goal um it's also more frequent in the sense that whenever a goal happens, okay, it's reported as being scored and not conceded. So in most cases, what you will find is that, you know, people will take the striker's perspective, not the goalkeeper's perspective, okay? Now, this asymmetry is not totally lopsided, but it's visible, okay? It's, it's um, um, a lot, this perspective is a lot more frequent than, than this, okay? Uh, now, on the other hand, if you look at the collocations with uh, a special kind of goal known as soft goal or howler. Now, before anything else, let me just say, let me explain what a soft goal is. Soft goal is a kind of goal that um, is that happens as a result of a mistake on the you know part of the goalkeeper because it was a very easy goal to save and under most circumstances it would have been saved, okay? Um, but due to the goalkeeper's inattention or awkward action or something, um, the goal happens, okay? And then what happens is um, something interesting. Um, what happens is that um, soft goals are conceded, okay, or are reported as being conceded a lot more frequently than they are um, scored, okay? So uh, if you look at the frequencies of how often this, this collocation um, is used versus how often this collocation is used, turns out that that you have a very strong asymmetry uh, in favor of conceding a soft goal okay and this is what you get um, so here are some uh, figures for English so um, soft goal is conceded 96 uh, in 96 um, instances or at the stations it's let in 23 times it's it's given away 23 times th 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 these uh, numbers by the way also come from coca all right so um, corpus of contemporary American English um, lists 96 instances of concede a soft goal, 23 of let in a soft goal, give away a soft goal, allow a soft goal 18 times. It's only scored seven times, okay? So as you can see, the asymmetry is strongly in favor of concede type verbs than it is for score type verbs. Um, this is how the word soft goal is translated into other languages. So in Czech, it's Latzini goal. In German, it's Steirator. But this is an Austrian German translation. For whatever reason, um, German, German does not have um, a good translational equivalent of soft goal. I, I have asked native speakers of German, both uh, um, soccer fans and linguists, and no one could come up with a good uh, equivalent for soft goal in, in German, except for this Steirato, which is um, confined to Austrian German. In Polish, it's Schmata. In Portuguese, it's Frangu, chicken, right? In Slovak, it's Latsny or Zbytoczny goal. 
And what's interesting is that for each language, you have the exact same asymmetry in favor of concede type verbs. OK, so here's a um, comparison for English, Portuguese and Spanish. As you can see, score is soft goal. Goal was used seven times in English uh, versus 97 times for concede. Um, a soft goal, so we have a ratio of one to almost 14. Then for Portuguese, um, again, there is a strong preference for concede type uh, collocation. So um, in Portuguese, you will find tomar um frango or levar um frango, engolir um frango, which basically means something like, you know, take a chicken or or you swallow a chicken. This is what the goalkeeper does. OK, so the goalkeeper concedes its soft goal. And there was only one. There was only one instance of um, the use from the striker's perspective. Aproveitar un frango, which is like take advantage of a of a chicken, right? With this, which is when when a striker scores a goal, a soft goal, right? And similarly in Spanish, uh, the expression is hacer una cantada. OK, this is what the goalkeeper does. And only 140 uh, instances of similar to Portuguese, you know, take advantage of a cantada. Um, so and again, I want to I want to draw your attention to the asymmetries here. So the the ratio 1 to 14, 1 to 17, 1 to 55 strong asymmetry in favor of concede type collocations. Now, here is um, another example, another mm, collocation, collocation with the uh, noun phrase own goal. Own goal is when, you know, um, a team scores to their own goal. So they basically, uh, by mistake, um, direct the ball into their own goal and basically lose a goal, right? Now, what happens here is, you know, own goal, own goals are, for English, they are scored 352 times against only 28 times when they're conceded, okay? And the same situation happens with other languages where, you know, here's this, um, table showing you the uh, frequencies for collocations with own goal. So for English, you know, not to dwell on this table too long, but the, you know, the, the, the bottom line is that the frequencies are strongly, oh, strongly on the score side versus on the concede side. You know, the, the, the ratios are not exactly the same you know for english it's seven to one for portuguese is 19 to one 17 to one only eight to one for german but 36 to one in in czech and in polish it's strongly lopsided it's 772 to one okay now so uh, there are disparities you know between these languages because the the ratios are you know widely different but the orientations of the ratios are the same for every single language you know there are more score and own goal collocations in use than concede and own goal so um so this is basically you know we can we can sum up the um our observation so far when you when you have a regular goal it's scored more often than it's conceded the same goes for own goal. It's scored more often than it's conceded. Soft goal is the other way around. OK, now why is it? Why? Why are these asymmetries? Um, you know, and also why are they? So similar in different languages, English, Spanish, Portuguese, Czech, Polish, German, you know, why why do we have the same kind of um, um, asymmetries found or the, the same um, orientations, the same dominant patterns found in such, you know, diverse languages? Well, we can we can explain these asymmetries by looking at the um, 
what I like to think of as um, perceptual dynamics. Because you see, when you talk about mm, scoring a goal, you have a choice of the collocation. And this choice depends on the perspective you take. You know, do you want to look at this goal from the scorer or from the goalkeeper's point of view, right? Now, the perspective in turn has to do with how you see the goal. Do you see it as a positive thing? Is, is it an achievement or is it a failure? Is it a negative thing? Because you see, a goal is rarely a neutral event, right? A goal in a game is a highly emotionally loaded thing. It's either a very positive thing or a very negative thing. Um, it's a rare occasion when a goal is seen as, you know, a, a neutral kind of thing. So you see, when it comes to regular goals, it's usually seen as an achievement because, um, um, goals are positive things rather than failures. And, and that's because you, you see it, it's very hard to score a goal in the sense that um, a, a striker is facing a very difficult challenge because the chances or you know the, the probabilities of scoring a goal are stacked against him you know the, the 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 striker has to defeat you know the defense has to defeat the goalkeeper and you know um, it takes a lot of effort to 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 score okay in in professional sports and professional soccer um, defense players and the goalkeeper are you know um, remarkably well trained athletes and make the job of scoring very difficult. So it's only when the striker rises to the occasion and does something exceptional and defeats the the line of defense and the goalkeeper that the that, that a goal is possible. When this happens, it's not the goalkeeper's or it's not the defender's the, the defense player's fault. It it you know the goal can be then attributed to special skills of the of the striker and then you know other things being equal it's seen as a very positive thing it's a very good um, you know very interesting achievement. On the other hand, soft goals well they are seen as failures because they shouldn't have been scored. It's the goalkeeper's fault you know, and um, this is how they are reported. Uh, they are they are seen as something, you know, like automatically you see a soft goal as a, as a negative, as as something that shouldn't have happened, but it did, and it's the goalkeeper's fault. Um, you know, you could also look at consider why do we not think of soft goals as, um, you know, something positive? Well, I mean, it, it, it there is no shame in scarring a soft goal, but um, when you look at the two perspectives at the same time, it's more of a failure than, a, than an achievement, right? Now, when it comes to own goals, there are also failures, but they are failures on the part of the scorer, which is why, you know, we think of own goals as, um, uh, or why we report them as being scored and not conceded. Now, <sighs> The, the, the perspectives that we take are defaults, they are unmarked options, and we um, take these perspectives automatically without thinking. And for the most part, they're really unconscious. You know, the speakers, if you press them why, you know, they chose the collocation with score or with concede, you know, they wouldn't be able to um, psychoanalyze themselves and explain why they chose the verb or the perspective that they did. What we know is that those perspectives are something that we do unconsciously. It's it's an automatic choice. Okay. Now the marked options are for special purposes. Right? So for example, it's it's not impossible to say talk about you know conceding an own goal. It's not very frequent, but when it's when it's conceded, it's um, um, reported in very special circumstances so I'll, you know to give you one example of a of a um usage of concede an old goal an own goal that there was a game where um the goalkeeper conceded three own goals so three own goals scored by his teammates um so 
it, it's all it almost makes it sound like it was really the goalkeeper's fault if you know if if uh, as many as three own goals were scored then you can also kind of attribute it to the um to the goalkeeper it's almost as if he's it's his fault and it's his failure and then it makes it kind of possible to use it with uh with the verb concede other than then score score now so why do these asymmetries even exist well um like I said, the unmarked options, the de default options, the dominant options are selected automatically and unconsciously. And this is this is important because unconscious processing uh, is important. It's um, it, it um, acts in the service of efficiency, which is a very common theme in when it comes to formulaic language. Uh, one amazing thing about formulaic language is that is is that it makes speech more fluent it makes speech more efficient you know when you use formulaic expressions which are automatic you can then focus on other things your brain can can um focus on other aspects of what's being said and not on the um selection of the um of the exact expression now is there any evidence because you know so far i've been assuming that there, there is a one is one option is a default the other one is a kind of like a recessive option but what evidence is there for uh, such defaults and there are three lines of evidence that i i would like to suggest here one is that as, as we have seen there is a cross-linguistic pattern okay so there are cross-linguistically consistent orientations for um for 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 these collocations if they were completely free in the style of the drunkard's walk then you know for each language the orientations would have been different but the patterns are consistent okay so we can see that there's something going on you know the options are in fact uh rigged okay there is something inherently mm, responsible for one option becoming more frequent than the other then number two the default is also hi historically primary. I'll show you in just a moment what, what I mean by this. And number three, the default is featured in metaphoric uses. Let, let's see at number two. See, when it comes to um, own goal, right, where I I claim that score and own goal is the default here, and it's the, that's the dominant um, uh, usage. If you look at the usage um, attestations from the past, this is the one that appears first. OK, so the first um, um, instances, the first attestations in Google Books are found, you know, in, in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, so here's one 1964, 1966, 1972, whereas conceding an own goal does not appear until almost two decades later. Right. So this is the this also suggests that, you know, the one option is the default because uh, it appears first, you know, historically. And then we have uh, the default is featured in metaphoric uses. So here are examples of how these soccer expressions are used in non-soccer contexts. So here's one, just give you an example. Tony Blair scored an own goal on Twitter after users had some fun at his expense by photoshopping a picture that showed him holding a placard. So whatever it was, you, you know, he made a mistake. He did something that harmed his political agenda, right? So this, you know, you can imagine what he did um, by picturing him, uh, you know, in the, you know, on the soccer field where uh, he's responsible for an own goal. Now, when this metaphoric uh, thinking happens again, we take the default perspective, which is the striker's perspective. OK, we don't imagine Tony Blair being a goalkeeper who concedes an own goal. He scores an own goal. And this is this happens for all the other, you know, the 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 the, the examples um, that, that I listed here. Um, I, I selected them on purpose from from both uh, from from British English, Australian English, South African English. New Zealand English, and this is from American English. In every single one, it's score, and nowhere is there, you know, metaphoric usage of concede and own goal. This also basically shows that score and own goal is a is a default. So, you know, just to sum up, the conclusions um, are 
that at least in the case of the the you know soccer um, um, variants of of soccer collocations, variation is not free. And that's because one variant sooner or later becomes the dominant option. The recessive marked variant may or may not be ousted, but when it survives, it is kept for special purposes, just like, you know, um, just like we saw, uh, you know, in the case of fallen autumn here too, uh, there is the dominant pattern, the, the dominant option, which is used on on any other day. And if you want to use the recessive, the less, less frequent option, you really have to have special reasons for it, you know. And uh, behind the choice of um, the, you know, of, of either option are special perceptual dynamics that basically determine which option becomes or which option is more natural or which option is more automatic than the, than the other one. And this is pretty much it. I'll be happy to um, discuss uh, these ideas further in question and answer time.